It's 0300. The base is quiet. You should feel safe here. There's no active conflict, and the barracks are secure. But you've seen the shadows, and you've heard its voice. Soldier. You know there's something more to fear than any mortal enemy. Something darker. Something already dead. From demonic-winged intruders disguised as visiting angels, to fierce protective dragons that guard your pathway to the astral. Join us on this episode of Belief Hole as we unseal the archive and play back the tape to present harrowing accounts from the outer edges of our reality. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jeremy. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. Summonings, Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, well, hello, hello. Wow, you guys are in stereo chorus. <laughs> Darn it, I hate that. That was weird. Welcome. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome, one and all. Welcome to be here. I'm Chris. I'm Jeremy. And I am the beloved John. That's sadly true. Most beloved. <laughs> the most beloved in the whole. <laughs> That's not true. We're all loved for different reasons. I think because I'm so sporadic, people are like, Who's that guy? Who's that little spice of fun? You get fun? to be the funny man. <laughs> I don't really think I say that much. That's what makes you so funny. You're the mysterious j- trickster. Man in the back. The man in the back. Speaking of men in the back. Well, okay, I don't know if that doesn't really <laughs> do with anything. Speaking of mysterious tricksters and the like, we have a fascinating and fun episode for you guys today. Yes. Strange Listener Stories 19. Jeez, that's a lot. Yeah, for new listeners who are unaware, strange listener stories are when we gather together and tell stories from the audience. Strange goings on. True. True stories. True stories. Purportedly. Purportedly true. That's right. You be the judge. It's up to you to decide. But a lot of these people we've talked to for quite a while because they are our members and some of them are pretty active in the show. So we wouldn't pass off anything we, that we thought was not credible. Right. But again, you can't know for sure. So it's up to you guys to decide. But we do have some fascinating stories. And we do have, towards the end of the episode, we have some heavier stories and accounts. So fair warning, if you have kids, there's some adult themes later on. We'll let you know before we get to that story. Some demonry and some, you know, adult kind of scenarios. So, but we'll give you a heads up at that point. Um, In the meantime, we have some other interesting stories coming up, don't we, Chris? Yes. We've got Marine Barracks Boogeyman Infestation. Okay. Uh, A couple of those, actually. Pretty awesome how these, when we do these stories, they seem to, the stories seem to create themes in the episodes. We've talked about that before. We'll get submissions from different people around the same time sometimes, or we'll come across them individually. About the same seemingly random things. Yeah, that have these themes like the Marine Barrack stuff today. It's really interesting stuff. Um, We've got Russian reincarnation recollections. Sorry about the alliteration. I didn't (laughs) like those alliterations. Astral dragon guardians. And then as you mentioned, Jerry, we have some dark entity visitations to talk about. Um, so this is going to be definitely a fascinating episode. Yes. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Yes. <laughs> People that keep coming back, we put out a lot of content. I know you guys keep coming back. All you have to do is just reach out, hit the like, help us get bigger. Give a little tickle. We appreciate it. Help, help the whole grow. Anyways, shall we light the fire? Yes. And get it going. Light it up. All right. Our first account, John, this was a pretty fascinating account that you brought in. This one comes to us. Do we have a name? Oh, it was anonymous, was it? Oh, that's right. Uh, this is actually was submitted. Uh, well, we know the we know the listener, but the listener requested that we kept anonymous because of the details in the story. But this, I thought, it was really fascinating and unique story. This is the Okinawa Demon. This happened in 2012. Yes, at the Marine Corps Base Camp Foster. 
When I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, we all experienced unexplainable things in the barracks. As I'm sure you know, Okinawa was the bloodiest battle of World War II, claiming 100,000 Okinawans as casualties of war or by suicide as ordered by the Japanese army, 110,000 Japanese troops, and 12,000 American troops. The chances for spirits to linger is high, having died so violently and with so much conflict. The location of the following encounters occurred in Barracks 5696 on Marine Corps Base, Camp Foster. The first is a demonic encounter. This encounter did not happen to me, but it happened to my friend that lived in a room down the hall. One night, I was asleep in my room when someone was banging on my door in the middle of the night. I was the barracks manager at the time, so it was my job to manage vacancies, fix discrepancies, lead cleaning, and make sure that new people got a room. It was the duty and my friend Allison, whose name has been changed. The duty said I had to find Allison a new room. She had a black eye, so I assumed maybe someone broke in and beat her up. The black eye was fresh and new. I had just seen her earlier, and she did not have it. She said she wanted a room at the opposite end of the hall and with a roommate. She was living in a room alone at the time. No one asks to have a roommate, which I found off, but assumed maybe she wanted to feel safe from her attacker. I got her a new room, no questions asked. Later, I asked the duty what happened. They said she came tearing out of her room, shouting that the devil attacked her. One duty grabbed her to make sure she was okay, and the other duty went into the room to search for the perpetrator. He went into the room and the window was locked, and no one was inside. He even checked the bathroom, the shower, and the wall lockers, and even the room and window next door. The window was locked and no one was inside. You cannot lock these windows from the outside, only the inside. Her room door was right within view of the duty desk. So if someone came in or out through her main door, they would have easily seen. Allison later confided in me, telling me that for the last three months, she had been in that room. Something was waking her up at night and pulling on her legs, arms, and even holding her down. She said her room was always freezing cold Okinawa is extremely humid, and there is no AC in the barracks to produce cold air. It's always boiling hot. With time, things escalated. This thing started to hit her and scratch her. On this particular night, she tried to stand up to the thing, and it threw her into her dresser, leaving the black eye, so she ran out of her room. A day later, a sergeant from another company heard of the incident. He spoke to Allison about what happened and then asked me if he could go into the room and perform a ritual. He was Native American and a leader of his tribe back home. I let him into the room and closed the door behind him. He came back out within 10 minutes and told me the ritual was not successful and to never let anyone occupy the room again. He said a dark entity, not of this earth, lives there and tortures anyone who dares to enter its space. I kept the room vacant as long as I was the barracks manager and passed it on to my replacement. That was over 10 years ago, so who knows what happened since. This next story is one of my two personal encounters. I was low ranking at this time, so I lived in the barracks and had a roommate. We had a shower curtain hung up and on a rod that separated our beds from the sink and the light so we could get ready in the morning and not wake up the other if they were still sleeping. We had a shared head bathroom with our neighbors and the bathroom door and also the room entrance was behind the curtain as well. I was laying on my bed watching TV with the curtain fully expanded when I saw the curtain start to slide open in the corner of my eye. I assumed my roommate was coming home so I didn't really pay attention until I said, Hey, what's up? And did not get a response. I looked up and saw no one. But the curtain was now slid all the way to the right, open. I immediately got up and ran out of the room. Looking around the hallway to see if maybe my roommate came in, but changed her mind. I called her and she was still at the motor pool and had not returned to the barracks. I banged on my neighbor's door to see if she was home 
and maybe came in but left. We know how to open each other's shared bathroom doors from the inside, but she was on an exercise in Korea. I ran back into my room, through the bathroom, and rigged her bathroom door open. No one was in her room, and no one was in mine. With no one in my neighbor's room, and with my room's door bolted from the inside, there was no way someone came in. I waited outside in the beer garden until my roommate came home later that night so I wouldn't have to be in the room alone. When my roommate showed up, I told her what happened, and her eyes got big, and she said that had happened to her too. This is my second personal encounter. A normal procedure when living in the barracks in Okinawa is standing duty and also having a fire watch on each level of the barracks. I was on fire watch in the third level hallway when I saw someone quickly walk into the laundry room. All I saw was a quick flash of a black silhouette. I shouted to them with no response and got up to see who it was because I was bored and wanted to talk to someone. When I looked into the laundry room, no one was there. It was 3 a.m., so not a normal time for people to be out and about in the hallways. I figured I was tired until I shared the story with other people who told me they saw strange silhouettes in the hallways as well. They would also hear people talking in the lounges or things moving around at odd times of the night on weekdays. Some would even hear dryers and washers from the laundry rooms opening and closing. Some people were so scared or convinced that someone was there watching them, messing with them, that they never once left their chairs to rove the rooms or the hallways. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If any of you guys listening out there are stationed currently at Camp Foster in Okinawa, let us know if this still goes on. Fascinating. I mean, this kind of stuff is not unheard of. It's pretty common to hear, especially in like bloody battle areas overseas. Mm-hmm. When people are stationed to have these sorts of things. And we covered encounters with the Jin in the Middle East, I think last season. But I mean, the the barracks one where she's kind of like directing where people go, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Like that is an interesting perspective. Like, uh-huh. Well, yeah, specifically that this girl, Allison, comes to her wanting a roommate which no one ever asked for yeah that's so interesting because a story have come up later in the episode from someone you guys out there might know as final girl on youtube she's a listener of the show and she has pretty intense encounter and story this thing that follows her but part of her experience was she didn't want to move away from home she wanted to go to college and live alone it like messed up her life because she was afraid to be alone yeah because she wanted someone there obviously very intense for her and when it affects you that much that you can't sleep and you're afraid to sleep you're afraid to be alone you ask for a roommate when most people would like their privacy. Yeah. Just an interesting detail. Especially if you're getting black eyes from it. I mean, that's pretty mm-hmm. intense poltergeist or well, demon or whatever this thing is to be pulling you out of bed. Why and, do you think, because the Native American guy that went in to try to get rid of it mm-hmm. said that it was this dark entity that... He said it was uh, not of this world. So some, I something mean, that was never human. It, first of all, like, I mean, why did it choose that room? Yeah. And why... Who knows? I mean, it's, doesn't it sound like... She had had her own experiences. Maybe something happened like suicide in that room or something. Mm-hmm. And then like it kind of came into that darkness. Feeding and on that. stayed in that room. It's so weird that it has a physical boundary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, We've talked about that before. It's such a fascinating thing with when it comes to borders and boundaries, when it comes to the spiritual really likes world. that room for some reason. Yeah. Well, who knows? It might not just be that room. Didn't she well, say? Apparently it happens all over the base. Yeah. There's paranormal activity all over the base. But the leader, the tribal leader said that it. Oh yeah. Don't let anyone go back in there. Right. It haunts that room well, maybe specifically. He didn't, maybe he didn't even know that there well, were more knows. experiences on the base. He knows. Yeah. Maybe he does. <laughs> he knows. But yeah, no, you're he right. to it. Told him, I stay in this room. Don't let anyone <laughs> yeah. come in this room. As long room. as no one comes in here, you know, live and let live. That'd be a heavy responsibility to be laid at your feet. Like, by the way, never ever in the future of the history of humanity, let someone stay in this room. You're like, well, I'm only stationed here another six months. No big deal. You know? Yeah, it'd be interesting. Like ge- as the generations pass, the next guy gets that job. He's like, no, there's one thing you need to know. Never let anyone stay in room Sounds three. Sounds like a good three. Stephen King short story. I wonder what happened before. Yeah. What caused were... this kind of negative? No, I mean like the people that stayed in that room before, because... It's not like the, that was a brand new base. You right. Know, right. People had been in that room before. Oh, that's a good point. I mean, and I always think it's really interesting to consider, like, could it be something about the land? Like, it may be even something, not something that happened in the room, but just something that somebody did in that area or some occurrence that happened there. That Right in that spot. I bet yeah. you those rooms are pretty small, so I feel like it would probably be because of that room. But Again, again if it's room. still in the room, I don't know that that's necessarily... It the, the, is. That's what the man <laughs> said. <laughs> There's a boundary. Uh, but no, it, it, you know, it reminds me of, do you remember we talked about, I forget what, where that was. Oh, the battle of Chickenagua. 
Chickamauga. Oh, the green, yeah. old green eyes, right? Mm-hmm. This thing that was seen, this kind of entity. Like was loping seen, around the dead bodies on around, the battleground. Yeah, sniffing and like, I don't know, gallivanting among the, de- the corpses like it was feeding on the death. Yeah. Like it was a death eater kind of entity. I do think that it, it's very likely that there are things like that that maybe are on just on the other side from us. Mm-hmm. That, that maybe the tragedy happens in a small space like that. And that becomes, they can manifest in that environment where maybe that person was connected to in that room. That was the last person this thing saw in maybe their last tragic moments. And this thing comes in and just like laps that up and bathes in it. You know? mm-hmm. It's a very dark idea. Is that your sound of the death eater? Uh, that's my scared sound. <laughs> was I scaring you? <laughs> Sounds like a scared balloon <laughs> losing your hair. Um, anyway, yeah, who, who knows? But um, it's a, that's a fascinating story. Fascinating tale. I'm glad you're okay. Yes. yes. Glad you're okay. Yes. And as we will see, there are other accounts in places. The, uh, the, our next tale comes from an Osan Air Force base in South Korea. Oh. This happened in 2010. This is called Go Back to Bed, Sergeant. And this comes to us from Matt. It was summer 2010. I was at Osan Air Force Base, Korea for an ORI, or readiness inspection. Now the dorms I'm in are at the base of Hill 180 where one of the most bloody battles of the Korean War took place. It's 2100, I'm lying in bed. I gotta be up at 0400 for arm up and guard mount. When I hear my sink turn on, I lean over and see a shadowy mass of someone by the sink. I say something along the lines of, what the hell? And I hear clear as day. Go back to bed, Sergeant. They're too far north to attack tonight. I roll over because the doors are locked. There should be no one in my dorm. As I roll over, the voice says, That's an order, Sergeant. And the mass is suddenly over me, and my shoulder is ice cold. I'm being pushed back into bed. I jump up and turn on all the lights, and there is no one in the dorm. I swear I didn't sleep a wink for a week straight. I talked about it with a few people from my unit who claim they had similar experiences with this dorm building. I have more experiences, but this one is the one that freaked me out the most. It was the first time anything paranormal ever physically touched me. Yeah, that'd leave a mark on you. Ooh. Mentally and possibly physically. Ooh, actually, we do have a story at the end of the episode with a physical mark that's pretty unique. Really? Yeah, just odd thing to consider. Super. Well, thanks for that story, Matt. Yeah. Weirdly, again, ties into our first story. I love how these come in like that. But uh, obviously, this is, seems less of a otherworldly dark entity that's feeding on death, but more of a, you know, maybe a memory, maybe a, a stone tape recording or potentially a tape echo. Yeah. Because obviously this thing is, at least if it is a conscious spirit of a disembodied person, they are unaware that they are dead. Right. Right. They're reliving that this time that was either significant or a perilous time in their life, or maybe they didn't make it out or something. Well, they're just pulling a prank on the guy. From the ghostly but side. I mean, is, would that would be proof for you, right? If you had that experience where- or That would be proof for you, so you said? Proof for you. Oh. Right? Like, I mean- Oh, absolutely. If you're a spirit speaking to you or a thing like this speaking to yeah. you and then rushing at you. And uh, what I like about it too is it doesn't seem like an evil thing. He's, he's concerned about him. He wants him to get his rest. Yeah, very, I feel like you would, you could, I mean, you could, it seems like one of those experiences where you might, after the fact, think, did I, was I half conscious? Did I- did my own mind make that, that voice up mm-hmm. and those words that were said to me, was I really hearing that? I could see yourself second guessing yourself, but did you say he saw the thing? Yeah. Well, this, that's what happened was he saw a figure. So he heard, he heard well, the sink turns on. It's not oh, just a voice that's he hears. true. That's kind of the a. The sink turns on, he rolls over, sees a dark figure, and then it says to him, go back to bed, Sergeant, as John so wonderfully reenacted. Uh, they're, they're too far north to attack tonight. Obviously referring to a specific time in the right, past. Right, right. That's pretty... I'd put my money on stone tape for that mm-hmm. account. Most likely. Yeah. Why does it have to be stone tape? It doesn't have to be. But I think the Chris brought up the point, the fact that he's it really sounds living. like he's suggesting something that's actually not going on, but maybe something that had gone on. Maybe someone yeah. who died there. It doesn't necessarily have to be a stone tape. Though. No. It could be a real ghost. Dude, but he's just stuck in the mindset yeah. of yeah. this is happening. Well, that's darker. It's a darker idea. A lot of ghosts are like that. I think all of them are. But we don't know if all that's... All of them. All of them. <laughs> Every last one are stuck in the past, replaying old events. Otherwise, they'd be gone. Well, well, that doesn't make sense because there are ones where people interact with them and they're, they seem to be aware of the, who this person is and following them. No, there's only one kind. <laughs> it's also almost impossible to tell what's actually 
otherworldly or demonic mm-hmm. or an entity versus a, a spirit. The, the trickster, of course, that will pretend to be the ghost of someone who has died, who is just using that form to to lure you in, you know, the whole Annabelle type scenario. There's always the, we talked about this, the, the chindi, you know, that spirit scum. Yes, I do like that concept a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's, I like that too, because it also affords like the feeling of not having to be concerned about a loved one who's passed, but maybe been seen somewhere. Right. Because if it's, if it is just the, the part of the person that couldn't ascend, ascend to the next plane, whatever move you on that to is, heaven or the next world, yeah, then that's a little comforting that, oh, it's just their goo that they left yeah. behind. If you guys don't remember chindi, that's the Navajo, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a Tibetan term for it too. And it's essentially what doesn't, yeah, move on to the next world because yeah. it's, it's a groating part of your soul. That's like, you know. Just like the negative sloth of skin. Yeah. Sloth of sloth. What a great phrase. (laughs) Sloth of skin as it falls off the meat. Sloughing off the spirit skin. You shoot up into heaven. It's just the. It just drops back down. And then we have to deal with it as it floats around just being grumpy. It's got to stay in the dense earthly plane. Exactly. It's too grumpy to go up. Anyway, thank you, Matt, for that. Perfect little tie on to our previous anonymous account. Um, This was a little change of pace here. Uh, And this, this story, next story relates to an episode we did actually relatively recently, I think it was the last Stranger Stories episode. This comes from Jerry. Yes, this comes from Jerry. Uh, This is about his son. This is called I Used to Live There. I was listening to a past episode earlier in the week. In the episode, a lady had called in about her son having memories of his, quote, real dad during a past life, and that one night he woke up screaming because his, quote, real dad was dead. It sparked a memory of something that happened when my oldest was about three years old. I'm not claiming this is paranormal. It could simply be something odd, but it certainly is interesting. My son was about three years old when this occurred. My wife and I had bought him a book called My First Encyclopedia. I decided to sit with him and read a bit. My wife was in the kitchen fixing dinner, but easily within earshot of her conversation. I was randomly turning the pages and stopping on different subjects with pictures and asking him questions, like, what's this? It's a tiger, etc. I turned to a page with an entry for Russia. I was moving to turn the page again because I didn't figure there'd be anything on that page that would interest him. But he shot his hand out and stopped me. He pointed to a photo of St. Basil's Cathedral and said, very excitedly, I used to work there. I repeated back to him, You used to work there? Yeah, when I was big and you were little. My wife by this time had moved over to see. He looked at me and said, I used to work there. Meaning my son was the adult and I was the child. I asked him, What did you do there? He said, I help poor people. Then he got a very sad look on his face and said, But then the bad people came. I don't want to talk about it. And he closed the book. My wife and I were shocked. I remember just staring at her with my mouth open. When I regained my composure, I opened the book once again to a different page with some animal on it. We talked about that. Then I turned to a page with trains or something and we talked about that. Then I turned to the page about Russia. My son just looked at the page. I asked, do you know what this is? Pointing at St. Basil's. He said, no. I told him it was a church in Russia and we moved on. He never mentioned anything about it ever again, and he doesn't have any memory of that moment. I don't know what it was, and I'm tempted to brush it off as just a kid's imagination. But knowing the history of Russia, the pieces could definitely fit. Anyway, I thought you might find it interesting too. Oh, we did. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, that would be pretty incredible to hear from your child. Really interesting. And I think especially because he, you know, if the, the child is just making things up or isn't using his imagination or whatnot, mm-hmm. uh, that he happens to be pointing at a church that just doesn't look like a typical church. If you've seen St. Basil's, he has all the like, you know, it's the oh, stereotypical it's Russian with the sort of ice cream cone. I'm not yeah. an architect, so I can't think of the term off the top of my head. Russian style. Mm-hmm. It's right in Red Square in Moscow, right? It's very unique. Yeah. Really interesting. And yeah, the, very ominous. Uh, but then the bad people came. I don't want to talk about it. And then the fact that the kid looked sad at that point, yeah. like it was generally remembering something, mm-hmm. genuinely, seemingly. Um, yeah, very interesting. Those stories are always kind of unsettling yeah. and fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. I looked up a little bit about this. St. Basil's, if you don't know the history about it. It's on Red Square in Moscow. Right, which has had, you know, a lot of things happen. It was built in the 1500s and it did have one of the, one of the things you could kind of attach to the bad people came and I want to talk about it. 
Napoleon invaded in 1812 and went through the Red Square. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. June 24th of yeah, 1812. And this building was built, what, in the 16th century? 1500s? Yes. Yeah. So just interesting, like plenty of time for people to be taken out different periods in time in this area. Yeah. And the way this uh, St. Basil's Cathedral was built and who even built it is still up for debate. There's legends about it, I guess. And one of the legends is that um, once, I think it was Ivan the Terrible, Ivan the Fourth, it was built under his reign. But as far as the architect who built it and that kind of thing is, I guess, legend. One of them is that once the architect finished building it, it was so beautiful and grand, Ivan didn't want him to, to build anything that came close. So he blinded him. So he couldn't build any. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. Yeah, just a legend. Can't say it's true yeah. for sure, but it's fa- But if you guys would we'll go this, with his name. It, yeah, it makes him pretty terrible. Was he, was he a descendant of Vlad? Ivor the Boneless? The Impaler? Vlad the Impaler? Different places. I know, but it could have, maybe they crossed over. <laughs> There's only a couple of bad people in history. <laughs> they must be related. And then I think they had Hitler. How far away is Transylvania from Russia? That's pretty close. I mean, it is in the well, Eastern, Eastern Europe. I feel like there could have been some sort of connection. Oh, for sure. Was it Transylvania or Romania? Oh, I'm sorry. Was it Romania? Transylvania was Dracula, but I think... Vlad the Impaler was... I think he was Romanian. Is Transylvania in Romania? Man, I wish I knew. <laughs> We're not geologists. I feel like they're probably fairly close, but... Transylvania is in Romania. That's I was o- right. That's obvious. Thank how you. Did we, how did I not know that? I said that. I knew. Gosh, guys. Sometimes I just get flustered, okay? But yeah, I, said that, I thought that was cool that he said, you know, I, we help the poor there. And it happened to be a church, you know, like just these things that seem to kind of align where it kind of corroborates his, his little child mm-hmm. story. Yeah, definitely interesting. Thank you so much for saying that in. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Yes. Thank you, Jerry. This next story is getting a little darker. This is a pretty fascinating speak pipe that was sent to us. And this comes to us from Maximus. This is called, You Will Call Me Master. Hey guys, this is for your podcast, Belief Hole. Um, I think it's one of the best paranormal podcast out there to date. So please keep up the good work. In any case, let me share with you my story. My name is Maximus and this happened to me in January of 2015. Um, up until that point, I had had to move back in with my parents to kind of reorder my life, so to speak. Um, I had lived a life of hard drinking, hard drugs, and a lot of promiscuity. And I had hooked up with a few women who were involved in the occult. And I say that because I believe almost wholeheartedly that this had something to do with that. So I'm at home and I had to be at work the next morning. I could hear my parents in the next room watching TV and talking, you know, laughing. It was just like any other night. I knew I wasn't going to get to sleep because I was a night owl. So I put my phone down. I tried to roll over on my stomach to get more comfortable. And as I do that, suddenly I realize that I can't move. I'd had episodes of very mild sleep paralysis before that, but this wasn't like that. I mean, I was wide awake. When that happened before, it was, you know, you, it was usually when you're in a halfway stage between sleep and, and being awake. So I was looking off into the distance because the only thing I could move at this point was my eyes, and this impending doom started to fill the room. You know, the only thing I could really liken it to is if, if you've ever been almost been in a horrific car accident, but managed by the grace of God to avert it. That feeling of sheer terror for those first few seconds, it felt like that prolonged and it was ever increasing. It was just getting more and more intense. And along with that, the room started to get even darker. There was a street light usually that shone into the bedroom, but that was suddenly gone. And the room was now filling up with like this blackness, almost like a smoke sort of thing but it was turning into like a darker shade of black. So it was almost like, it was so black, it was like a pint of Guinness or a cavity, much darker than it it usually would be. And it just kept getting darker and darker. And suddenly this blackness started to form a mass of something very masculine, something very, I knew it was a male presence, but it was very overbearing and very evil and very intimidating. And suddenly I felt that I was lifted off of my bed. I'm wide awake and I can still hear my parents out in the other room, but I can't scream for help and I can't talk. But I could suddenly feel hands being wrapped around my neck and it was like its thumb was pressing into my Adam's apple. It started to tilt my head in such a way that I, I guess as if to tell me that it can do whatever it wants. So I, uh, I started to know as if it was speaking to me. And it was as if, if you've ever had someone screaming in your face, like right almost nose to nose, only I couldn't see that face. Uh, it, was, it was like a 
seven, eight foot, you know, linebacker almost, but just all black, like a shadow. And it started to tell me that you will call me master. You will call me the master. You will do it now. And it just started repeating these things. But again, it wasn't in a language. I just knew that that's what it was saying somehow. And I didn't want to give into it, but I also didn't want to be in this position any longer. So I eventually gave in and I, I said, okay, you're the master. You're the master. And I don't know how many times I said it. Finally, after a few times, you know, it finally let me go and threw me back onto my bed. And suddenly the room started to get, you know, the, the less and less dark now. So it was kind of going in reverse. And that, that evil presence was now gone. But I was left with the memory of what the hell just happened. I uh, can't really describe it in any other way other than I tried to put it out of my head for a few years after that because if I thought about it, it was as if I was acknowledging to myself that it definitely was real. And it was almost as if I had to kind of relive it over again. I couldn't even talk about it with anybody because I would get severe anxiety if I did, you know, to the point of where I would feel like I couldn't breathe. Well, now in my life, of course, you know, I'm much changed. I mean, I, I actually do believe in, in God now and I, I'm an Orthodox Christian and, um, you know, I definitely believe in the paranormal. And like I said, I, I find your podcast to be extraordinary. It's, it's got a lot of great stories on there. I hope you can do something with this story. Um, hopefully it, it will change anybody out there who's maybe a bit of a non-believer or skeptic. Cause I can tell you right now, these things are very real and, uh, and you need to be careful of that. So, all right. Have a good one, guys. God bless. Holy crap, man. That is a really creepy story. Yeah. And good advice. Yeah. You got to be, first of all, you got to be careful who you sleep with and what you do with your life mm -hmm. because you leave holes, I think, if you are doing too many bad things. Yeah. You definitely leave yourself open. And especially things. if, yeah, if you're messing around with people that are into the occult, you never know like what. I've always heard the thing that, you know, if you are being intimate with someone, like you kind of share. Oh, it was like a connection. Well, it's more than a connection. Like you're like sharing part of your soul oh, with right. them. Yeah. And so sharing your energy. If you're like commingling with something really dark and they're into really dark stuff, you mm -hmm. may be leaving a lot more open than you. Oh yeah. Stepping in a relationship that you're unaware of. Well, yeah. for sure that, yeah. If, and I've heard that too, that if something, for instance, is attached to someone that that can be shared almost like a STD. If you think about it that way. Oh, yeah. Like the movie it follows actually is a good yeah. example of that. Not that fiction. That, obviously that's fiction, but that idea um, is something that people have experienced before. Mm -hmm. And if you're close to someone, you're sharing every intimate thing with that person. You're going to be sharing your psyche with them. You're going to be opening yourself up to things that they may be open to, you know, obviously not to the same degree necessarily, depending on how strong you are in your own self and your perspective. But obviously when you're sharing at that intimate level, there's yeah. going to there's be a connection that, that will at least present the opportunity for you to be in contact with something that maybe is attached to them. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we say it all the time, starve your ghouls. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a humorous way to basically say, yeah, don't give things that are out there that are dark any food. But it's interesting in his story because he had to give in in that moment, it seemed right. like, to, just to break free in that moment and had to call it master. That would be a very unsettling yeah. experience. Because, yeah, generally you would say, you know, you, know, you want to face it down and say, I'm not giving you any power. A lot of people that have had these like intense, dark stories end up, you know, reaching out to God because if there's dark, there's light, mm -hmm. you know, and they have to find a higher power, rebalance like their, their lives to some degree. Yeah. It all does seem to come down to that and come down to finding that strength within yourself as well, you know, through that and having the willpower to, it's interesting actually, because the final girl, the story that we have coming up, she didn't have as much luck with that because she was raised in a very strict religious home and I had bad experiences with that with her family. Her sister tried to take her to a kind of exorcism for what she was experiencing, and it was humiliating for her and didn't help. And then, but eventually, well, I won't spoil it all right now. We're going to get to the yeah. story. But well, it seemed like he like kind of changed his life though and went in that direction. It's probably more mm -hmm. than just believing in God, but you're definitely like moving towards a lighter side of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, totally. Yeah. And it's, I was just going to say, it's interesting, as I said earlier about how like thing, stories come in around the same time sometimes that are very similar. Yeah. We have another speak pipe that I'm saving for future listener stories because I thought it'd be too much darkness in one, but it is an incredible tale of uh, this guy who's dating, again, dating a girl who's into this stuff and, but sees this thing 
regularly when they're out together, they'll be in a park and this thing will appear behind her and we'll have some kind of a control over her. just, um, pretty horrifying, very, very fascinating account. Yeah. We'll have to do down the road. Very but. similar. Yeah. This kind of attachment idea, but dark, dark indeed. We should take a break. Yeah, absolutely. What's coming up on expansion? Good question. Oh yes. Expansion. Camp Creepily three. <laughs> Really? Yes. Our insanely popular and asked for and requested Camp Creepily series is having its third installment in the expansion for members. Nice. Yeah, we figured it's an unseasonably warm day here in February, so why not celebrate well, yeah. with a campfire stories episode? What are the odds? Ohio, February, March 1st now, and it's 60 something degrees ah, today. It's just teasing us. It's just mm-hmm. teasing it's us. so nice out. But it's just odd timing that we decided to do this Camp Creepily thing. And I woke up and I was like, oh, it's beautiful. It's perfect. Let's talk about campfires and freaky stories, true accounts. Yeah, we're going to talk about otherworldly winged beasts, talking sheep. We got more talking sheep. I don't remember that from last time. Yeah. We got boy on the water. This is an eerie tale we'll be telling. And then staff wielding watchers in the road. So this is going to be a fascinating expansion. Yeah. So you don't want to miss it. So here's a clip, guys. Sign up and you can join us there after the show. Link in the show notes. If you are bored. And you need, <laughs> if you are bored and you're easily amused. <laughs> no, if you need more stimulation in your life, mm-hmm. if you need better friends, more money, you should sign up for the, for the expansion. Because we can appeal. promise all those things. Sex yeah, if appeal. you want to be better looking, more muscles, mm-hmm. all of these things can be promised. Better hygiene. By signing up for the expansion. Yes. You get it all. <laughs> and that is a promise from <laughs> Believe Guarantee. Signed contract. Yes. All right, guys, sign up uh, and you can hear this episode. Here's a clip from Camp Creepily 3. Access granted. I've never really experienced anything until I actually moved into a town located in the San Bernardino National Forest. Moving into town, I wanted to explore some trails. I ended up finding a trail nearby where people can go shooting and a few trails to hike. When we arrived, there were a lot of people, even a family that was setting up their generator and chairs out as if they were going to camp. I took my kids and my aunt, and we found an almost dried river, and we started walking along it collecting small rocks. We were very intrigued by collecting them, and we were having so much fun. My aunt and I were saying how happy we felt there, almost mesmerized, as if time was going by so slow, and nothing around us existed but us in that moment. Hmm. Then I heard a creepy meow. Almost robotic, and I stood up and looked around. I heard it a second time. But I saw absolutely nothing. After the second robotic meow, I got a little freaked out. I gathered my kids and told my aunt we should start heading towards the car. Hey, time to go, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome. Welcome. Hope you enjoyed that clip. Yeah, hope you enjoyed that expansion clip. Uh, Sign up if you're not a member. It's a great episode. Now we are back into the strange listener stories, guys. Back around the campfire. And here we have a tale from Danielle. You guys might know her on YouTube as Final Girl. She's been around the chats, hanging out. Now this story, I'm going to say there's aspects of it that are pretty heavy. And some of it, they're sensitive themes. So I had to edit her story a little bit down because of YouTube. Um... You guys should definitely go check out the full account of her experience. It's a very intense, fascinating story, and I think informative for people that might be going through the similar thing. If you want to read the full account, I'm going to put a link in the description on YouTube. It'll take you to our website where you can read the whole thing in her own words. But this is something she went through for 20 years. She's only shared the story publicly one time. It's essentially a story of sleep paralysis and how it affected her life and the terrifying things she experienced within. But she wanted to share it because she's hoping that maybe through hearing her experience, what she went through and how she kind of came out of it, maybe it'll help someone dealing with the same situation. She was the youngest of seven kids. There's a huge gap between her and the next sibling. She already kind of had a sense within her own family that she didn't belong. In addition to that feeling, she was also a big nerd, very anxious in social situations, really cautious kid. So she would avoid things that normal kids were doing 
in that ended up isolating her even further, which is already sounds like kind of a opportunity for taking advantage of. Right, like the preying of certain things on the most vulnerable. We hear that all the time. She also grew up in a strict fundamentalist Christian household. There was the great existential fear of hell and punishment that was taught to her at an early age. So she just had a very intense, kind of lonely childhood, it sounded like. Without further ado, I'm going to play part of her story here, and then we'll follow up afterwards. My first experience happened when I was about eight years old. I was staying the night with my nieces at my sister's house. We were sleeping in sleeping bags in the basement. We had left the lights on because, like most kids, the dark made us anxious. In the middle of the night, I woke up, staring up at the light fixtures in the ceiling. It didn't take long for me to realize I couldn't move. I was frozen, and my chest began to feel heavy, like someone was lowering a weight down onto it. It felt like my breath was being slowly crushed out of me, and soon I could no longer breathe at all. I tried desperately to move my body. Anything. A finger. But nothing. I remember looking over the side and seeing my niece sleeping soundly. I tried to move my lips and mouth to say help me, but I was frozen and utterly helpless. Then, a black mist began manifesting itself into a writhing hooded shape. It had red slits for eyes. I don't remember how I was eventually able to wake up, but I do remember that when I did, I was grasping for air and terrified. It's scary. It was weird, but I chalked it up to a vivid nightmare. So that was her first experience, and that happened when she was only eight years old. That's a pretty common experience, too, that during a sleep paralysis episode, obviously the weight on the chest, not being able to breathe. The knocked mare. Yeah. Yeah. That's a common, like, initiating Mm -hmm. attribute to these experiences. And then the hooded shape. Yeah. Writhing hooded shape. We've heard about hooded cloaked figures in people's rooms. That was my experience was that very same thing Mm -hmm. in the corner of the room. Where are they coming from that they need a hood? You know, Mm -hmm. that's just a weird... But it is something that's very commonly seen. Even when you have gnome encounters in people's rooms. Yeah. Yeah. You know, muddy-faced leathery textured small munchkin men in little cloaks that are scrambling. I mean, that's obviously a different thing. But yeah. There's something about the robes. Right. And I, I, w- I would like to say real quickly, because we'll, we'll always get these comments on any time we do a story about sleep paralysis. Yes, there's scientific explanations for aspects of sleep paralysis, but there are certainly cases and commonalities between a lot of cases where it seems to indicate there's more going on than just someone who's woken up before their their body has gotten out of the sleep state. Right. We've covered that before. Yeah. Was, that's why I just wanted to throw it out there. Like, I don't want to get into that again. No, that's an important, important point. Um, anyway, so this happened when she was eight. And then, unfortunately, this became kind of a cycle. So it was kind of this random experience. And then a month later, it happened again. But then once it happened again, it would start happening a few times a week, every few weeks, and then a month off. And then she starts thinking, you know, why am I suddenly having this strange experience? But after this cycle starts beginning, she realizes this isn't going away. And that was right before it got really bad. So then from the ages of around 11, she starts experiencing auditory and physical disturbances along with visual disturbances during these episodes. In this next part, she'll explain something that would happen sometimes nightly for weeks on end. Essentially throughout the course of her life from being the age of 11 to 29 or 30 years old, this happened to her hundreds of times. So this is an experience that kind of is a single description of something that would happen to her over and over again. I would wake to find myself in my room, looking up at the ceiling. My eyes would dart around, and I'd become aware of a sinister presence. There would always be a low rumbling and a hum, permeating the air. Then these shadow creatures would swoop into the room. They would fly around and swoop down, scratching me and cackling. They would whisper in my ear, and breathe hot, putrid breath on my neck that I could clearly feel and smell. My blanket would begin to move like things were skittering underneath it, crawling all over me, and squeaking like mice. They would crawl in and out of my mouth, nose, and ears, and also other more private areas. Those were only a few of the things I was subjected to. Others included feeling myself levitating and turning over to see myself floating above my body, floating out of my bedroom window in a red beam of light. One time where I saw what I thought was an angel, I realized very soon that that is not what it was. And this was a unique addition to the usual torment. This particular episode had started with the paralysis, the awareness of a presence, and the terror of knowing what was to follow. 
The room felt like it was vibrating, like there was electricity in the air along with the growl and drone of whatever darkness was present. The usual rumbling grew louder until it was almost deafening and the entire room shook violently as plaster fell from the ceiling. Holy crap. I could feel my body and bed shaking. Suddenly, a light appeared at the foot of my bed and began to grow into something more solid looking. It stretched itself into the form of a glowing, robed figure. It was so bright, it was like I could barely even look at it for long. As I stared at this thing, terrified, not able to move, I noticed it had two glowing red slits for eyes on an otherwise featureless face. It had no mouth, but somehow I could feel it smirking at me. The most overwhelming part was the wings that protruded from this thing's back. The wingspan filled the entirety of my room and beyond. Through the walls on the right side and out my window on the left, I thought perhaps an angel was appearing to me, but why was I so terrified? Why couldn't I move? But people in the Bible were always terrified of angels, right? Made sense. But something in me just knew this thing did not have good intentions. It was attempting to trick me. I've never had another time in my life where I felt so completely terrified like I did during these episodes. To the point where even my waking hours, I was having panic attacks and went through periods where I was even afraid to leave the house. <sighs> Horrifying. Yeah. It's that idea of something pretending to be an angel looming over you in your bedroom. Yeah, that's like the darkest kind of thing you could experience. Yeah. Also, considering the fact this was happening, you know, starting out early, eight years old, but then 12 or 13, when she was essentially, as she experienced it, believed she was being sexually assaulted by demons on a regular basis. Jeez. Imagine at that point, you don't know what sex is at that point. You know, as a you know young Christian kid, you're supposed to wait to have sex till you're married. And yet this kind of thing is happening to you. How do you even begin to talk to someone about what you're experiencing? Yeah. The fear that you must have, the frustration. Anyways, this, this went on to basically wreck her life. It severely affected her mentally. She developed anxiety, depression, panic attacks, even agoraphobia. And the lack of sleep ended up making her paranoid. So her life is falling apart when all this is going on over the years. She has passion. She has passion for music, the art she was pursuing, but she ended up passing on a lot of opportunities. She didn't go to college simply for the fear that she would fail due to the fact that she couldn't sleep properly. And, and this was the key point that relates to the earlier military base account is that she said, quote, I was scared to death to be on my own out in the world with this curse or whatever it was that haunted me. Yeah, you'd always want someone with you, I'm sure. Exactly. And then the sad part, of course, you know, it sounds like she didn't have a great understanding with her family growing up about religion. Her sister tried to take her to what was called a deliverance session, essentially a kind of exorcism. And she said it just ended up humiliating her. It didn't help. And then the guilt and shame of everything she was going through, the failures because of the missed opportunities because of all this made her suicidal, paranoid, addicted, hysteronic, she says. And what does I, that mean? I don't know. Hysteronic means dramatic or theatrical. Oh, okay. Okay. But interestingly, she didn't find out what sleep paralysis was until she was about 27 years old. But at the same time, she's like, it, this can't be what's happening to me. It just seemed too easy to be true. Like she'd love that for, for that to be it, but it just seemed too easy of an answer. And John, I think this kind of wraps up her story. This is an interesting quote from her perspective, if you wouldn't mind reading it. When I turned 30, my doctor referred me to a sleep specialist for insomnia. We had a very long talk where I kind of broke down to him and let out some stuff I had been holding on to forever. He brought up sleep paralysis. I asked him if he was sure that even the most horrific of the episodes had been a symptom of a chronic sleep disorder and not real. He assured me it was. The more research I did on the topic, the more convinced I became of the rational explanation. But it does still baffle me how for centuries people report seeing eerily similar things all over the world. Funny thing is, once I stopped being afraid, it stopped happening altogether. Like it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that I added that part. <laughs> it's so true, though. Once I took away the power it had over me and turned around to actually confront it, it stopped, finally. I am now making up for lost time and getting back to the things I love most, writing, horror, and music. The sleep disorder explanation for all this does puzzle me. How folks all over the world throughout different centuries report seeing very similar things. It does make me very curious as to why we see and experience the things we do during these encounters. Well, if you ask Maximus, 
Mm -hmm. there's more to it than that yeah Yeah, and i think could be personal too depending on the person and their experience some of them could be more real than others and i think it's a good point that you made there when she stopped being afraid is when she stopped having these experiences i mean that goes right to the yeah i mean on your fear idea. i mean that's i've even had experiences like that or when you're in a really dark place yeah you know emotionally it just seems like that stuff nightmares there's just a darker energy around you. It just seems like you're more vulnerable Yeah, mm-hmm. for whatever is out there. You got, you got to giggle, you know? Got to be a giggle boy every Laugh in its face. Confront it. Crack a joke. That's why humor is important. But I, I want to clarify with her during her sleep paralysis, because I think she mentioned dreams and um, she followed up to confirm that she said, quote, I was definitely awake. Sometimes all I could do was blink and I would blink really hard to make sure I was feeling it. I could hear the TV in the next room and the sounds of my parents' footsteps still up. That's weird. Yeah. I was very aware of my eyes darting around the room. I was just paralyzed and couldn't move a muscle. So these weren't dreams. Yeah. And the sleep process, of course, I think you can have your eyes open and oh, yeah. seeing things. And But the idea is that you're hallucinating. And then I asked her about the robes. I was curious if this was a specific color of this kind of entity or whatever it was. The robes were glowing and running seamlessly into the figure, kind of wispy like the Dementors in Harry Potter, but bright white light. And before it formed, there was like an assembly of lights all coming together and forming it into the figure. Oh, interesting. That's quite a scene, quite a picture yeah. of paints. But yeah, well, thank you so much for that final girl. I'm really glad to hear that you're getting back into your passions yeah, and um, for sure. moving beyond this kind of darkness that you lived with for so long. I can't imagine. Yeah, it must be nice to be normal. It really does sound like a curse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you're when something has followed you and haunted you for two decades of your life. Yeah, that's terrifying. That's got to be irrevocable harm, I feel like, that you've, ha- you've had to go through. And just the uphill battle that you have to fight to get past it. So here's to you, final girl, Danielle. Yes. Thank you for sharing. May you have better times ahead. By the way, John, final girl, do you know what that term means? Mm-mm. Okay. Oh, you don't know? So just to let you know. It's a killer screen name. I final think. girl is the trope in horror movies, the girl that like survives to the end. Oh, really? Like Jamie Lee Curtis. Sydney Prescott, Sydney Prescott scream. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that has a lot of meaning in your life. Yeah, that's interesting how that connects. Great name. I want to be a Sydney Prescott. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> what? I don't know. Nev Campbell. Okay. Get a rifle. I did watch Scream. I watched like the first... 45 minutes of the first scream oh, like so a good, couple dude. weeks ago it held up yeah it holds up very oh well. it's a fantastic movie yeah it's really really it's good funny clever yeah creepy I saw the trailer for the they're putting out another they just had the, the kind of the final one with the last cast scream I don't know, five you don't think anybody else is going to be coming back but they're doing another one already and i saw the trailer and what i'm just bummed to see at least in the trailers there's no humor in it like that was always kind of one of the key elements to the scream pictures live that... alone <laughs> live alone man um, but it was, was it was the the nod to like the horror genre itself and the kind of the, right. the comedic aspects that i mean it yeah it's, it really adds another level of enjoyment to the whole thing yeah if you can go in and out of the fear and yeah. humor like we do mm-hmm. right it's very meta the scream franchise yeah Wes craven was great with that he even played the janitor Oh yeah, in the first movie where he's mopping, but he's wearing the Freddy Krueger yeah, sweater. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so great. There's so many like references that I are love, so good. I uh, love what's his face in that movie too. Henry Winkler. Yeah, he's uh, the principal. Oh, so great. That was the first time I saw him as like that type of character. Me too. Yeah. And I was just like, that is really funny because he's like the Fonz, you know, like, right? Some very like tough guy. <laughs> he's just kind right? of like a, <laughs> kind of a, 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 a nice principal character, yeah, kind like of goofy. Soft. And then of course he's great in Arrested Development. Oh yeah. Same kind of lawyer, a little more goofy, but pretty yeah. close. Yeah. Anyway, That's great. Anywho, let's do the last story. All right. This last story, we're going to mix it up a little bit here. I love this one because it's one of those strange experiences. You know, we did a really awesome couple episodes on astral projection, out of body experiences, inner paths to outer space. We covered that book and we talked about the sort of entities you might see if you're traveling in the astral plane. And this is a pretty cool story. This comes to us from Tiffany and this happened in Windsor, Massachusetts in 1995. This is called The Dragon at My Window. When I was about 14, I shared a room and bunk beds with my younger sister. We lived in a big house in the middle of the deep woods. My father had built the house 10 years prior. My siblings and I had quite a few strange experiences here, but one of my most vivid occurred one night when I was laying in bed on the bottom bunk, which faced the window. My sister's was at an angle and faced the wall. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew, I was floating up to the ceiling and I thought, I can go outside. So I gently air swam 
up to the window frame. Air swim, I like that. And got ready to push myself out. I think we can all relate to air swimming. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, a huge silent dragon appeared, blocking my way. Not menacingly, but like a guard. She opened her mouth and roared at me, but it was totally silent. Like what cats sometimes do. It freaked me out and I pushed myself out of the window frame and landed back in bed. Not longer after that, a couple months later maybe, I woke one morning with three jointed claw or long finger marks on my left bicep. It was not a bruise though, more like a place where my skin was much darker of a shade. Everyone asked me who grabbed me and it didn't fade for months. The dragon seemed female and was somewhat a mix between Asian and fantasy, but with a more sheer and kind of gauzy appearance further down the tail. I wish I had taken a picture of the grab marks too. Even my principal asked if someone had hurt me. Weird. Yeah, it's kind of interesting story. I like that idea of it being like a protective, like a guardian. Don't come out here. Yeah, you're not ready to swim in the astral. Yeah, that is, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you hear those stories a lot in Falcor. I knew you were going to say that. I'm a luck dragon. Um, Here we go. <laughs> yeah, uh, we covered the interpass to outer space and even journeys out of the body with uh, Robert Mon Monroe. Mm -hmm. He would talk about that. These sort of guardian entities that you might come across and the experiences you'd have. Of course, you know, she said she fell asleep or she thinks she must have fallen asleep because then she was floating out of her body. Yeah. This and that. But maybe it was in OBE. OBE. I mean, it definitely sounds like that. And this, I, this I thought was really interesting. So I was just looking around online to see if I could find any accounts because I didn't have time to go through my books and find, you know, white dragon <laughs> correlations in, in my out-of-body books. Window that I dragon, have. yeah. But I did come across this from Quora. Someone just interestingly asked this question on Quora years ago. Has anyone ever encountered a white dragon guiding you in the astral realm? I asked the universe for protection and guidance to enter someone's dream. And I, in fact, did. The white dragon guided me to and from. Isn't that weird. weird? So kind of, I mean, probably not, but are you suggesting this person entered Tiffany's dream? Maybe. And I the mean, dragon was like, I'm here to drop this dream yeah. wanderer off. I mean, probably not, but I, it does give me chills to consider that idea. Weird. What a weird connection hook up there. Dreams are so weird. Yeah, they are. Uh, OBEs, all that stuff, but dreams in the layers alone. of reality. So one of those things is just so impossible to really discuss because it's a, it's a place, I feel like when you're considering like trips, for instance, like mushroom trips and that kind of thing. When you talk to someone about an experience like that, if say you have a really interesting trip with friends, you can kind of sync up and experience yeah. the same stuff and talk about it. But dreams are like wholly individual. Mm -hmm. Like you might usually, be able, usually, I mean, we've actually had shared dreams. Yes. But that's maybe because we're twins. I don't know. Or I think you can, if you're just really close to someone psychologically, but yeah, dreams specifically seem to be something that it's so frustrating. You can't take it into this world. You know, mm -hmm. I think, and is that similar in your death experiences, John? Because you had a great conversation with Lamar about his near-death experience. Mm -hmm. But is there an aspect to it that you can't verbalize? Because it's just so not of this world? Yeah. Like, so it just reminds me of like, even, even in something as simple as dreams, when you try to, yeah. you, you still have to lose it it's when you come like back. It's more of like a feeling. Like I, every day I have that. Like every day I think about the dreams that I had before and it's hard to put them together. My, but it's like a feeling. It, yeah, it's so strange. Yeah, dreams are just bizarre, man. Yes, they are. And they seem to be getting more bizarre for me. Yeah. They're just so like real. And then like I wake up and I'm like, oh yeah, this, this place. There are definitely those hang on feelings of like, I know that was real. Like I live there and it's that you start to lose when you wake up. Like I have these dreams where I'll wake up and I will immediately remember a splinter of it where in that splinter, oh yeah, there was this thing that I was doing that had 10 years of history behind it in that existence. Yeah. Like any random example, like there was maybe a certain food I was making that only exists in that world or something. And there was, it was a part of the town that I lived in there. It was like a tradition to make it for the last like four years. But I, that's like a splinter that's, oh wait, that's not real. That's, that was the dream. And then that whole universe of time in a previous existence just dissipates and you can't feel it anymore. It goes mm -hmm. away. It's just, there's like a brief period where the reality hangs with you. Yeah. And then it starts to disappear. That was a weird example, making bread. I yeah. I, we did those uh, episodes on dreaming in nightmare land. This is a fascinating phenomenon when it comes to like characters that you seem to interact with in your dream, sometimes bringing things back to this reality from a dream. I had that experience the other day where I dreamt that I changed my car insurance. Did I tell you about that, John? Mm -mm. That this, was crazy. I had this dream. This is like last week. 
I had a dream that I met an insurance agent who was super nice and that I talked to him for a bit. And then I decided to go change my car insurance. The next day I get up and we go to the coffee shop down the street and the barista, she's like, oh, these drinks are bought by these nice gentlemen over here. And so I went over to the guy. I was like, hey, how you doing? Thanks for the drinks. I was like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I work for State Farm uh, insurance agent. And we're actually buying drinks for people to, you know, maybe see if they'd be interested in joining us. And I was like, I last night dreamt that I met an insurance agent. Oh, that's weird. And then I changed my insurance. So I was like, I will be giving you a call, sir. Because <laughs> like, why, <laughs> I mean, what else can you do at that point? Have you called me? Just bizarre. Not yet. What insurance list. do you have? State Liberty. Farm? Oh. Liberty. 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 Yeah. Liberty. Stop. It's too much money. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, yes. you need to make that switch, sir. I know. That's the universe talking to you right there. Keep switching around. Anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, dreams, layers of reality, I think. And uh, synchronicity, we will be doing that episode coming up, but that all ties into dreams too. I've been already kind of looking into that more and more as we get closer to that episode. Fascinating stuff. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah, thanks for sharing your stories with us. We're happy to have you. And before we go, we do have a few people to thank. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, too. Arianel Sky. Oh, wow. Beautiful. That's a very interesting name if I read it right. It could be Ariel. That's even beautiful. Arianel. Yes. Ooh, single word. The very best. interesting. Anyways, welcome to the show. Welcome to be here. Steve, Stevie Bolden. Yes. You are a bold man. <laughs> we used to be so much more creative with this. <laughs> no. uh, Jonathan Merrill. Yes. Welcome to the show. Hello, Jonathan Merrill. These are kind of harder names to do things with, but I do love Jonathan Merrill. I'm glad he's here. Yes, welcome to be here. Oh, Stevie Bolden, by the way, was a bold dogman whisperer. I should have said... Dog man, welcome to the hole. <laughs> Guys, get your prescription filled for the belief hole with Dr. Zykes. Ooh. Oh, hello. <laughs> yes. Zykes. Yikes, it's Zykes. Or Zix. Z-Y-X, either way. It's a beautiful name. I'll take that prescription. Welcome to be here. Uh, Bu or Bia Guzman. It's Bo. Yeah. B-E-A. Yes. Yeah, Bia. check yourself on that one, huh? <laughs> Bia. Maybe Bia. I don't either way. It's a gorgeous name. Welcome in. Welcome to be here, Bia. Yes. Bia here. Thank you to Bia here. Katie Dockery. Ooh. Ooh. Hello. Katie, welcome in. Katie did the right thing. Katie did the right thing. She's in. Yes. Thank you so much, Katie, for being here. As a dogman whisperer. Oh, wow. Oh. Eric Hutton. Hutton me Ooh. sillies. <laughs> what? what? Yes. That sounds like an Irish leprechaun having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> Hutton me sillies. <laughs> welcome in, Eric. Lucky charms. It's like shiver me timbers, but oh, Hutton me go. sillies. I should have figured that one out. <laughs> Michael <laughs> Buskirk is here. Ooh. Don't take the train, take the bus. <laughs> Drive into the church, because Kirk means church in German. Scott Murphy, mm. welcome to the show. Oh, he solves mysteries with his lady brown. I don't know. What? I don't know. With his lady brown? <laughs> We're all having strokes today. <laughs> I do the, feel like What's Murphy Brown is what I'm thinking of. Oh. Did she solve mysteries? Is she just a lawyer? I don't remember. She's well, a news no. reporter. That's right. I was way off. It was a, she was a character. She's fictional. Yeah. Manuel or Manuel Flores Ooh, is here. Welcome in, sir. Yes. Welcome to be here, my friend. You're an angel in our hearts. Happy to have you here. May Alejandra. Oh, hello, May. Hello, May. It's my favorite month. I can't wait till May comes this year. Yes. yes. Thank you so much, May. Kristen O. Oh, 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 Kristen O. That's oh. it. Okay. Oh, Kristen oh, O. Kristen's oh. here. Welcome to the whole Kristen. Yes. yes. I hope you have a passionate rage for the show, my friends, because Dogman Whisperer Fury is here. Ooh. Frightening. <laughs> Fury, Fury, Frightening. Fury <laughs> got his own little Wait, song. Wait, could it be yes. Furry? It's Fury. Is it one R or two? One. Oh, welcome in. I think that's how you spell it. Justin Soto, another Dogman Whisperer. Right. <laughs> Yeah, welcome. Justin Soda, thank you for being here. Russell. The love muscle. <laughs> Russell, the love muscle. <laughs> wow. I was, was, was going to say strange at the end. Russell Roos or Rouse. Russell Rouse, the love muscle. Okay, <laughs> I'm so bad at pronouncing names. I'm sorry, Russell. Welcome in. Russell Roos, we'll say, or Rouse. We love you. Guys, get out those lightsabers. I hope that that was an intentional reference and not your actual name because you probably get this a lot. Josie Skywalker. Is here. Welcome. I doubt that's a real last name. <laughs> How awesome, though. It was at one point in a galaxy far, far away. That's true. <laughs> that is a true story. Thank you, Josie Skywalker. <laughs> we love you to be yes, here. Yes, yes. Love you to be here. Brant. Hi. Brant? Brant. Come on in, Brant. Simple but elegant. Maybe it's your second grade teacher. I did have Miss Brant. That's true. That might be her. We love you. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you, Brant. Every name has to be said like six Jonathan times. Shankovich is here. Shank my bitch. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Sounds like something else. Jonathan Thanks, Shankovich. Thank you for being here. Uh, Quimberly. 
I've heard her name like eight times. Yes! I don't think so. Did we do a Doctor... I cross-referenced the list. We did do Quinberly like last time. Oh, I cross-referenced the list. It wasn't on there. Oh, maybe it was a different Quinn. I know we said Quinn. You might have read it coming into the inbox and then your brain thought we did no. it. Because we were like, Quinberly, that's interesting. Oh, we did have another Quinn. It was Quinberly. Yes. Quinn. Qu- it was Quentin. No, that wasn't it. We'll keep going. That's it. Yay! <laughs> Welcome in, everybody. That's all on the list for today. If you haven't heard your name... Don't expect Stay it. Stay tuned. No, don't say things like that. <laughs> People take you seriously. I know. I am. You have to understand, I have a very dry... Wait, what the heck? When I use the pinch thing, it stops recording. No, it's still recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the sound engineer over here. Anyways, thanks for joining <laughs> us on this show of Belief Yes, Hole. thank yes. you so much, everyone who's here and being a part, sponsoring the show, getting all the extra content, and come on over to the expansion. We'll be lighting up the bonfire and having some uh, marshmallows as we have some fun camp stories yes. to talk about. Oh, great stories. And John, it. Really? We are having, oh, we yeah. are doing, the, this is a real account of something that <laughs> dis, is described as it, it of the Sonoran Desert. It's a great story. It's described very similar to basically the it, the penny character. Not, not a clown, but right. just like right. this evil entity, this just, it's a fascinating story. Is it a story. shapeshifter? I think there's some shapeshifting in there. Feeds off your worst fear kind of thing. There's the fear, there's the malevolence. And this was found in 40 and Times, uh, an archive, web archive of the 40 and Times yeah, magazine. I found it from 19, well, this story takes place in 1993. Awesome. So it's going to be a fascinating episode, guys. Uh, sign up and uh, check it out, members. Awesome. We love you. And we'll see you next time on Believeful. Potty time, and then we get to do werewolves. I roll over because the doors are locked. There should be no one in my dorm. As I roll over, the voice says, That's an order, Sergeant. (laughs) (laughs) Is that too much? I kind of like it. Yeah, do it again, but I like that one. That's an order, Sergeant. (laughs) You're like Rick from Rick and Morty. Let me try it one more time. That's an order, Sergeant. (laughs) Good, very good, Steve. People used to call you Jeremy. That's true. Because you were filled with germs. That's why. It had nothing to do with Because you were filled with germs. The only germs. thing similar to my name. <laughs> <laughs> There's Jeremy's filled with germs. <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy filled with germs. Jeremy, oh, Jeremy. Gosh. For the record, this was never. I mean, you had pink eye, like not that long ago. You were filled with bacteria and germs. <laughs> Jeremy's thinking, thank God I edit the episodes. <laughs>